Last week, we took a look at the word corona in the Bible, specifically Exodus chapter 34. If you haven't yet participated in that service, I'd encourage you to go back and do so. Uh, there's a, something going on in the world right now, sort of prophetically, that is in direct dichotomy and opposite of what God's intention is for the world. And we see that in Exodus 34. This morning, I have a message for you entitled, So Much Noise. And it's, I want you to encourage you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. It goes like this. Everything is permissible for me, but not all things are beneficial. Let me say that again. Everything is permissible for me, but not all things are beneficial. You gotta understand the context here. This is not a free for all. He's not saying like, do whatever you want to do when you want to do it. He's not saying go and sin, do, you know, be licentious, get into the debauchery. He's not saying anything because he addressed that in verse 9 and 10. The context here is he's trying to get us to look at what it is we do. And does it build us up? Does it reflect the glory of Christ? And we have to discern what it is we do that we're permitted to do, that we have license to do. Uh, Adam and Eve had license to eat of any tree in the, in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything was permissible for them except that one thing. Well, there are many things that are not permissible to someone who wants to live a holy life, but there are many choices that we can make that aren't even addressed in the Bible that we have to discern. Is that the direction I want to go? Is that something I want to do? Is that very Christ-like? Is that something that Jesus would join me in? Is that something that's going to edify and build up or is it going to separate and tear down? We've got to make those choices, especially those choices get accentuated and they get magnified when we go through difficult trials. What are we doing that we're allowed to do that maybe we ought to discern we don't do or change or reorient or recalibrate what it is we do, how we think, how we act, so that we are edifying in Christ-like in a time of calamity? Does your activity and behavior impede being like Christ? Now, you know what I'm getting at. There are those, not everybody, and I don't like it when we stereotype and generalize that everyone's really anxious or everyone's fear-ridden or paralyzed with fear. That's not the case. I'm sure some are. But there are also those who are lonely right now. They're all alone or locked up, feel cut off. There's a lot of things that we're going through. He says, everything is permissible for me. And then he says, but I will not be enslaved. That's an interesting word. I will not be enslaved by anything and brought under its power, allowing it to control me. Yeah, now we're getting somewhere. Everything is, benef is permissible, not everything is beneficial. But I'm not gonna get into anything that's going to enslave me, it's going to control me, it's gonna take over my life, it's gonna rule and reign over me. This is something you gotta get really a hold of in times of trouble, calamity, darkness. Not just now, any time in life. Nothing's going to enslave you, nothing's going to control you, and nothing is going to have you brought under its power. Nothing. Although that does happen. Let's talk about that. Are there things that you're even passionate about that become your master? Careful, because anything that comes between you and your Lord between you and your master, and if it masters you, if it impedes you, if it's permissible even, and impedes you getting to him and him getting to you, there will be opportunities for that to be eradicated. We always need to be on our guard about those kind of things. When something, some ideology, some circumstance, some situation, some calamity, some malady of some kind, some season of lack, when it begins to think for you, when you relinquish your critical thought, your discernment, your spiritual discernment, and things start to think for you, they take your mind and run with them, like anxiety or fear, worry, trepidation, even an ideology that isn't even totally biblical. When you get immersed in something and it's so subtle, now listen, it's always subtle. It's always subtle, it's always slow. It's never a fire hose, it's always a drip. And you find yourself, I don't, why am I thinking this way? Why am I feeling this way? Why am I going there? Why am I acting this way? It's subtle. When something starts to think for you, when something starts to speak for you, when something 
isn't fully discerned for what its intent is. You have a responsibility, as do I, to be on guard for that. I'm gonna give you some examples in a minute. When something starts to make decisions for you, when you start to make decisions not based on truth, not based on fact, not based on reality, but based on emotion, on feeling, on fear, when you start having those things think for you, you're gonna make some poor decisions. When you get all riled up, all, you know, all jazzed up about something, a circumstance of some kind, and that circumstance changes who God is, and you act with him differently because of the circumstance, you're in trouble. Because that's thinking for you, it's speaking for you, and that it actually will end up manipulating you. When it informs and inspires you, and you begin to relinquish, because something you're more passionate about, more afraid of than you are God, when something trumps him, you're in trouble. And certainly on your way to trouble. When, when a circumstance or a season of time or a season of lack becomes your counselor, you're in trouble. You're on your way to being in trouble. When the wonderful counselor is no longer the Holy Spirit and you kind of bypass him, bypass God, and you're now in reactionary mode, you're in trouble. What is it, my friend, that might be controlling you? Something not worth ignoring. What could possibly be controlling you? What are you aware of that's sort of leading you and being a Lord in your life? It can be a sin that so easily entangles you. It can be a, a situation. It can be informed by many different aspects. A pandemic, for instance. The media, for instance. There are messages coming to you, I call it noise, constantly being, <laughs> coming your way, a barrage of, of noise. And if you're not still, you're not quiet, you're not listening to the voice, but you're listening to noise, it will start to control the way you feel, the way you think, the way you act, what you do, what you don't do, how reactive versus proactive you are. And, and there is a book called the Bible, I think it's called, that will actually help you filter the messages that are coming your way. Filter it and filter it well. God is totally into emotion, but he's not all that happy about emotionalism. He's not into exaggeration, over magnification, living three, four, five, six months into the future rather than three, four hours into the day. No, he doesn't do that. Cultural trends and ideology and, and mindsets and, and even politics will enter in and begin to tell us what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it and how we're gonna feel. I say this in jest, but a very innocent, well, maybe not so innocent. You know when you get into college football and you got your team and you're passionate about them? I remember watching with my wife at three o'clock in the morning in Hebrew, the national championship with the Georgia Bulldogs while in Israel, one of the worst telecasts I've ever seen in my life, with the worst outcome that one could ever have come up with. I had gotten too much into this thing. I'm bummed out at seven in the morning that my team, who hasn't won since 1980, I might add, got beat in the national championship. Oddly enough, after the game was over, it was time to get your clothes on and go join the tour group. And within 30 minutes, we were on the Sea of Galilee in a boat called the Hallelujah Boat, worshiping God. Wow, what a perspective that was. Oh, you, you're, you, I'm so sorry for you. Your team lost. Oh, that's horrible. And then I'm out there and these birds are flying up over the sea and the wind's coming through here. The waves are through. Feel the mist on your face. Like there's an anointing on this thing where you're just worshiping it. I put it all in perspective. There it is right there. When you get too much into something, it will cost you something. It will cost you perspective, if nothing else. I've been watching something that's been going on with me for the last couple of years and has to do with the media. I have, I have seen myself watch the media I have grazed on the media during an election year. I have listened intently with discerning ears to all different media stations. 
You see, when I was a kid, some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. When I was a kid, you turned the TV on and your dad sat in the sofa and every time you wanted to change the channel, you, I had to get up and change it, right? I had to change it. There was, there was no remote. Forget, the only thing remote about it was the idea that my dad was gonna get up and change the channel. You had three stations. Walter Cronkite was on one of them, I remember as a young boy. The picture of integrity. I mean, anybody in the world that wanted to know what was going on in the world, turn on Walter Cronkite. He was the guy, did he, was he not, that announced the assassination of JFK. Walter Cronkite was a household word. He had those goofy looking glasses, and when he spoke, everyone listened, and everyone took what he said as, oh, here's a word we don't use anymore, journalism. It was ethical, it was right, it was true, it was fact. You could fact check it. Well, what happened when I got older is that they had this thing called cable television. What is that? It's not where you wait till six o'clock for the news to come on, it's where the news is on 24 seven. Now, can you imagine what transition that was to go from six o'clock to 6.30, maybe seven, to all of a sudden 24 hours. Now you have 24 hours to talk about stuff going on in the world. Is there any subject in your life that you feel like talking about 24 hours a day? And to do so is a lot of work, takes a lot of effort. In fact, maybe, just maybe, you have to add in a few things. Maybe embellish a few things. Maybe if you wanna keep your sponsors, you gotta get your viewership. Maybe you just might have an agenda of some kind after maybe 23 hours of talking about the same subject. And that's the world we live in today. Whether you like it or not, what do I care whether you like it? It's the truth. We have, this station's got this agenda, this station's got this agenda, this station's got this agenda. We listen to them all and eventually they control us. Listen to all of them and you'll get a different perspective. In fact, I like turning on the BBC. I like to see what the British have to say about us. It's like a fish swims through water and eventually doesn't realize it's in water. Now, that's noise, and boy, is there a lot of noise out there right now. 24-7 noise. We need noise, though, because it tells us what's going on. It informs us, it educates us. It, it's something we need to know. We, need to be, we don't need to bury our head in the sand. We need the noise, okay, we need. But when the noise, which is permissible, all of a sudden is not beneficial, and it's telling us how to feel and how to think, when we walk to the television to learn how to live, we're in trouble. When people start telling me what I need to think, how I need to feel, I'm in trouble. I have, I have an opinion, I have a mind, I have the mind of Christ. I don't need the world telling me how to think. I need my brain washed, but I don't need to be brainwashed. The news, the noise comes at you from every angle. Some of it good, some of it not, some of it halfway decent, whatever the case may be. The whole world's listening to it and we're getting freaked out. We have reason to be freaked out. The question is, to what extent will it control us? To what extent will it edify Christ? To what extent will it drive us from him? To what extent will we get so out of where our element needs to be that we become a source of anxiety rather than a Solution to it. When does the church get so caught up in the noise that we can no longer minister to the same people listening to the same messages? And all of them are good, and sometimes all of them are not. But it is the world, you do realize. It is the world. That book you have in your lap, my friend, is reality. That's truth. My job to tell you that. I'm assuming it's your job to like it. Noise. Everything is permissible, but not all things are beneficial. I would say not only, <laughs> we, we have to watch the amount that we listen to noise. The abundance of noise really causes someone to internalize that noise and become really scared. If you're sitting at home and you're trapped in your, your house and you gotta take a break, my friend. Man, what are you gonna look like on the other side of this thing if you do nothing but sit around and listen to the news? I'm scared for you, that's what I'm scared for. How wigged out are you going to be? Because I know 
that isn't prompting you to pray, it's prompting you to be afraid. Humankind's current cultural moment is highly prophetic. If you turn the TV off, put your cell phone down for more than five minutes, walk away from it, walk in the woods and ask yourself this question, what in the world is going on? What is going on? I don't want someone telling me what's going on. I don't need an anchor person or a TV show telling me what's going on. I need the Spirit of God to tell me what's going on. That's something we ought to be asking. What's going on here? And the fact is there's this dichotomy that exists between noise and voice. Not all voices are the voice. Not all noise is true. We don't need to turn the TV on to find out what's going on in the world only, although that's helpful. We need to turn on a channel with God and say, what am I doing here? What's going on in this world? And where am I in relationship to you? And what do you have for me in relationship with other people? That's all you really need to worry about in life. Your vertical relationship with him and your horizontal relationship with other people. What are, where am I in this situation? I'm educated, I'm not stupid, I know what's going on. Where am I, where is this church? Where are you leading this church? That's what we need to be asking those questions. Where are you leading my family? What are you leading us to do? See, there's a difference between noise and the voice, the voice of God. Another thing that I notice is there's numbers. Man, we like numbers. We love numbers. And numbers aren't necessarily true trust. What kind of, what kind of numbers am I talking about? Well, we're, we're, our, our, our culture, your life is full of numbers, friend. How many, TV how many TV channels do you have? I was trying to find, a, I was trying to find something on the Sirius radio the other day. I don't even know how many numbers I have. I have over 900 channels. I don't even know what to do with that. I'm Googling how to find something on the radio because I have hundreds of numbers to go through. It seems like every band in the 70s and 80s has their own station now. I had no idea. There's 12,000 comic stations. There's 100,000 news stations. It's, there's weirdness. There's a guy in his basement in Chicago has a station on there. I don't even know what's going on. Numbers, 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 and there's lots of things. All right, listen, I want you to stay not, not, not 50 people in a group. No, not, not 25, no, 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 not 10 people in a group. No, we're gonna do a million, a tri no, no, not hundreds of billions, not 150, 250, a trillion. No, not, not a trillion, two trillion. It could be 2.3 trillion. You're gonna get two checks. No, 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 we don't know yet. It's gonna be four checks. Could be a thousand, could be three, could be 1,200. Forget paying your taxes. In it. We're gonna do that in July. All oh, that's wonderful, but I'm saturated with numbers here. Saturated. It's not, it's permissible, but it's not beneficial to sit for hours at a time and look at the statistics of a death watch. Gideon had this issue, numbers. The Bible talks about numbers. Gideon had too many people in his army. God didn't like how many people he had in his army. He goes like, this is in Judges 6, read it later. If you have any time, are you kidding me? Judges 6, well, wait a minute. I mean, you got too many, Gideon, too many guys in the, in the, in the military here. Isn't anyone engaged or gonna get married soon? Send them home. Is there anybody that, that's afraid? Like, send them home. Anybody don't want to fight? Send them home. In other words, how do we get this from tens of thousands of people down to 300? How do we get it down to 300? That's what God wants to do. How do we take the numbers being thrown around and get it down to 300? Because that scenario brings glory to God. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with all the numbers. I'm just saying the numbers get overwhelming and you lose perspective and it manipulates how you feel. 1 Samuel 17 and 45, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. David had the possibility to go the numbers route. This guy is three and a half feet taller than I am. There's two of them and one of me because he's got a sword bearer with him. His reach is a foot and a half longer than mine. He outweighs me by I don't know how much. 
You know what David did? He maybe took a page off of Gideon and he said, you know what? I come at you in the name of the Lord our God. I'm gonna call on the name of the Lord our God. I don't care what the numbers are. You know something I feel like is very interesting to me? We've been in this crisis for I don't know how long, way too long. I have not heard one Christian, not one email, not one text, not one social media post, I may be wrong, not one that has looked at the numbers and the overwhelming numbers and said, I'm gonna call in the name of the Lord our God and I'm gonna call that virus down. You know what? We have just revealed to us, no one's praying against the virus, we're praying, I don't know what we're praying. We're not even praying maybe, I don't know. But the numbers, the numbers reached the point where it was beyond prayer. That's fine, that's interesting. Numbers. Some trust in chariots and some in horses but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Apparently, our actions say there are scenarios that control prayerlessness when they get so overwhelming, maybe it seems kind of silly. Listen, I like silly. I want more silly in my life. If silly is praying against a virus, that seems to be so multiplied and exponentially infectious and the contagion is far beyond, well, it's not beyond my faith. I hope not. Numbers versus true trust. Striving versus active stillness. There's something that I've never really been able to answer until now when I read the 23rd Psalm. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. Get God's perspective. Turn the TV off for a minute. Get God's perspective on the world. He wants to redeem the world. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He's moving refugees about. He's opened up closed countries. He's closing open countries. He's, He's trying to get people in a position to see the gospel. All he wants to do is redeem mankind. He wants to cash in on the death of his son to save all mankind, every tribe, every nation. He wants Abraham to be the father of many nations. I know we just think about ours more than we should, but there are many nations out there and God wants them all to be saved. And what does he see when he looks at this world? Hurried, rushing. He allows something to come to pass in this fallen world, but he'll capitalize on what he allows because we are a fallen world and he's gonna make us lay down. And we are laying down. We are laying down by green pastures. Well, actually, we're laying down, but are we laying down next to green pastures? Are we making this opportunity in your home? And I'm serious about this. Is your home becoming a place of praise and worship, stillness, wholeness? What is that? What is your home? What's coming into your home? What's coming into your home right now? And I'm not talking about disease, I'm talking about messaging, fear, anxiety, lust. What's coming into your home? And what are we doing about it? He will make us lie down. We were overly active, now we're not. There's some verses now that just seem to take on new meaning. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. I've seen these on the news and this, this is good noise. Something about it that just is harmonious. It's just something you want to see, you need to see it. You know it's out there, but you haven't seen it in a while. All you've seen is bickering and complaining and polarization and divisiveness. You want to hear it. You just need to hear it. You know it exists because it existed years ago, and it's not existed lately, but it does exist. And that's people standing on balconies applauding medical professionals. It's people putting their hand on the windows of nursing homes and It's people who took an oath to provide medical treatment for others who put in their life on the line. It's it's the core of who God wants us to be, that the noise and the polarization, the divisiveness, the bickering, even the bipartisanship we see in our country right now is so refreshing, so refreshing. I've heard our president say it, and I agree with him. This is, this is war, we're at war. This is a wartime situation. War versus peace. When God looks at the world, 
in a pandemic situation, he sees a world that he deeply loves. He thinks globally, he thinks redemption, and he realizes that we have an invisible enemy. In, the, in modern day life right now, in everyday life, in the reality of the, of the physical realm, we have a picture of the spiritual realm. We have an invisible enemy all the time, we always have. And our enemy is not flesh and blood, it never has been. We're not bickering with one another because we know we have a common enemy. There is a prince of the air, and maybe through the air it is transferred, but there's always been a prince of the air. There's always been something going on. There's always been a war going on. There's always been a spiritual battle going on. We're just being reminded of it. In fact, how so are we being reminded? Just open your eyes and look. There are metaphors for spiritual warfare everywhere around you. Every word that's spoken. People are going to war in emergency rooms and they need protective gear. We're supposed to be going to war every day for people's souls and we wear the armor of God. People are masking themselves to protect themselves from one another and we're, to, we're not to mask ourselves or the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, we're at war. The prince of the power of the air. And we too need protective gear, the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith, helmet of salvation belt buckle of truth. People are becoming deeply depleted right now. Physically depleted, spiritually confused, emotionally depleted. And there's seemingly no end in sight to this treadmill of anxiety and exhaustion. And, and this seemingly, for medical professionals anyway, this inevitable destiny with infection. This is life for many people, apart from a pandemic. You see, this is life for many people, and what is it they want? They're depleted, and they're hungry, and they don't have answers, and they need, they need to be as infused. Why do I call these things we send out every morning infusions? Because I know that people need infusions. They need a power boost. They need a jump start. They need a kick start for their day. And they didn't know to start their day with some hope, with some authority with some power, with some reflection. Be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't get drunk on wine, it leads to debauchery. Be ye filled continually with the Holy Spirit. That's Ephesians 5 and 18. That's the kind of war we're in. Any army needs to continually be resupplied. I want our church to be that army. What is your filter for what you're hearing in this world? How are you ascertaining what is permissible and at what point is it no longer beneficial? What safeguards or guardrails are you putting up in your life that are moving you more towards common and further and further from uncommon, that are moving you towards unholy instead of holy? What's starting to control the way you think? Not anymore, stop it, stop it. Let's recalibrate, let's reorient. I've given you this before, but I, I'm gonna give you two verses, and if you're at home, I want you to write these down. I want you to put them on your refrigerator if you have to. Put them on the dashboard of your car. These are things we need to be reminded of continually. Philippians four and eight. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. If you take those things, it spells the word pre-plant. Praiseworthy, righteous, excellent, perfect, lovely, admirable, noble, and true. That's what we need to have on our mind. That's what we need to be thinking about. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. To the extent you're immersed in some kind of noise, and it's gone beyond its point of edifying, and it's now costing you your mind and your heart. Perfect. Righteous, excellent, praiseworthy, lovely, admirable, noble, and true, then cut it off. It's not worth it. Second verse, whenever you get in a squivet, Isaiah 26 and 3, you pull this thing out and you make it your prayer. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. There it is. When we move off the calamity onto Christ, without sticking our head in the sand and denying his existence, nor exaggerating it either, we're gonna be fine. That's what we're called to do. Everything is permissible, not everything is beneficial. As we prepare 
for Holy Communion. I wrote this a few days ago. It goes out in our phone app in a couple of days, I think. I don't know. I want you to listen to these words. There are many idols being worshipped in this world. Idols have no blood. The idols are without life, without laughter, and they're void of joy. Idols provide no passion and lack an understanding to even giving or receiving love. Idols cannot purchase another's redemption for they cannot die for they were never alive to begin with. Idols are cloaked in narcissism, a robe made of tightly woven deception. Idols exist to draw you away from Christ, the son of the living God. Not you. Not you, not this church, you know that. Life is in the blood. You have crossed the bloodline. You have crossed the threshold from lifelessness into life. Only by the blood of the lamb do you have eternal vibrancy and pulse. He has purchased you with his blood. You are his, you were bought at a great price, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. No, no ransom so premium, so high has ever been paid. Never again could a ransom so high even be imagined. The church is his, obtained by his blood. And behold this lamb of God. Behold the lamb as if slain. Walk in the light as he is in the light. The blood of Jesus, the Christ, will purify you of all sin. He began bleeding on your behalf at Gethsemane. As your scapegoat, the father began impressing the son with the crucifixion ahead. The father began pressing into the son the sin of the world. Your scapegoat became one with your sin, though he was without sin. He took your purchased sin outside the camp, apart from you, that you may be judged righteous. Christ is your navigator. He is your bright and morning star. Your Lord is your true north, and he, by his blood, separated your sin as far as the east is from the west. Jesus the Christ is your faithful witness. His blood marks you, his blood speaks on your behalf. Christ is no idol. He first lived and then he died and then he rose in life again. He even now ever lived to make intercession for you. He hung in your place so you could stand in his righteousness. Death passes over those with the blood on the doorpost of their hearts. Death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The blood of Christ speaks for you. The blood of Christ covers you. The blood of Christ atones for you. The blood of Christ redeems you, justifies you, insulates and protects you, and is even now sanctifying you. You sip from a cup of redemption, and he guzzled from a cup of suffering. Let's prepare to take communion together. I would think that most of us are accustomed to having communion in a sanctuary of a church, beautiful architecture, stained glass perhaps, perhaps at a mass service or, we don't, we don't have that luxury right now. But it doesn't diminish the need, the value to come to the Holy Eucharist and give thanks, partake of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. As I said this week, we may not be together, but we don't have to be apart. This is what brings us together, keeps us from being apart. What we have in common, the blood of Jesus Christ and the body of Christ. If you don't have your elements ready this Sunday, I'm sure you will next, but for right now, let's just be still. Let's examine ourselves, shall we? What is it that is permissible in our life that has become not so very beneficial? Is it a sin, is it a addiction, it is an absence of your own personal thought, discernment. Someone speaking for you and thinking for you. What ails you in your body today? An 
organ, back, back spasms? What ails you emotionally today? We have a meal to take together to nourish you and nurture you back to wholeness. I want to pray over these elements and I, I want you to pause wherever you are in your home or wherever and just be still and hold your elements and, and agree with me, shall, shall you? Father, consecrate these elements as the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Set them apart. Make and keep them sacred. We come to this meal in a mysterious fashion with the sacredness of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. I ask you to forgive us of all unrighteousness through your blood. And I ask you, Father, to cover our homes with your blood, cover our minds and hearts with your blood. I want to ask that fathers, wherever you are, I want you to serve these elements to your family. And I want you to partake of the, the bread, the, the body of Jesus Christ. This world is falling apart in part for having rejected Christ because Christ holds all things together. He was broken that you might be whole. I pray for that wholeness in your life and in your family's life. Let's partake of the bread together. The night our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke and he gave it to him. He said, take eat, this is my body broken for you. We sip on a cup, as I said earlier, he guzzled suffering from a cup. Gethsemane. Your sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. May he heal and restore any and every area of your life and your family's life by the blood of the Lamb. The Bible says they went out and sung a hymn. Let's lift up our voices to Christ this morning, the Son of the living God.